Now, welcome to Vistac's SME Conversation Show, where we feature regional insights as well as information about companies and solutions in the SME space. Now, today's SME conversation is around EY's Asia Pacific SME Survey. Now, here to tell us more is Andrew Gilder, EY's Asia Pacific Banking and Capital Markets Leader. Andrew, welcome to the show. Thanks, Brian. It's great to be with you. Now, Andrew, for a start, give us an overview of EY in the APAC region and your practice specifically. Okay. Um, yeah, so we, we serve our the largest um, banking capital markets clients in the region, so all the way from New Zealand to, to China, um, and we help them with their, their most complex problems. So um, we've got a, a transactions business, um, an audit business, um, a consulting business and obviously our traditional tax practice. Um, and what we really thrive on is helping banks um, solve really complex problems. And today, um, in today's world, that's, that's around technology-enabled change to serve their, their customers is what we spend quite a lot of our time on. Okay, but before we zoom in on the tech aspects, your survey talks about the impact on the COVID academic uh, uh, pandemic on SMEs in the region. Um, could you tell us how banks have adapted to that? Yeah, it's actually been really interesting um, to see how banks have responded in a really agile way, actually. I mean, not only the banks have responded, but the SMEs have responded. So the SMEs have been forced to accelerate their transition to digital. So with everyone working from, from home um, and not being able to get out and about, businesses have had to respond. Now, in turn, banks have also had to respond. Um, so they've, they've accelerated digital payment solutions um, and digital delivery of all of their services, um, including relationship management to, to the SME segment. Um, so it's been a really agile period for SMEs um, and the banks that, that serve them. Um, what the survey also showed us was that, that, that ASEAN SMEs um, were most were some of the most heavily um, impacted by the pandemic. So, you know, we had Indonesia and, and Malaysia being at the top of the list um, as negative impact from COVID. But what we also saw was the pivot to digital. So it was these markets that also said they had made the biggest transition to digital delivery to their customers. Um, so it's been a really, really exciting time. Now, Andrew, I, I think I want to zoom in on that, the change in the landscape and competition because of that shift to digital. One of the things that shocked me when I read the survey was the fact that Malaysia and Hong Kong have the highest rates now for SMEs using fintechs as their main financial institution. It's 28% of SMEs for Malaysia and 26 for Hong Kong. Why has that been the case? And please shed some light on that. Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting observation. And, and you know, you, you look at the other, the other question that we looked at when we were, we were thinking about that was the trust score. So we also asked the SMEs um, their, their level of trust in certain providers from the traditional bricks and mortar banks to, um, you know, big techs and fintechs. Now, what we also saw was that in Malaysia, um, there's a relatively high level of trust in, in fintechs. And so that, that kind of makes sense because there's alignment between, you know, the level of trust and that higher uptake of fintech. But in Hong Kong, that doesn't hold. Um, but what we also saw in Hong Kong, that there was a lower level of trust across the board. So there is some relativity there that the, the differential in trust um, between traditional bank and fintech is less in those two markets. Um, and therefore, people feel more comfortable with a fintech as the alternate provider to their traditional bricks and mortar bank. Um, what we did see, though, consistently was that there was still a relatively high level of trust in the traditional banks. But we do expect that that will change over time as you know, more fintechs and big techs um, enter into the consciousness of the SME um, segment. Now, Andrew, one of the things is on our shows on BizTech, 
we've also had fintechs, everything from digital banks to to peer to peer lenders. And, and I want to zoom in on one particular fintech that basically is a large player in the region funding societies. Now, one of the, the as we drill down into the conversation with the CEO, one of the things that they saw as an opportunity, which then grew their, their, their business tremendously, was they went and attacked areas where the traditional banks could not deliver competitive services. So it's everything from micro financing to invoice financing to, to supply chain financing. And even interestingly enough, in dealer forecourt financing. So they really went into specific niches yeah. and, and went for smaller customers at first. And, 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 and harking back to what you just said about trust, they went to the smaller players first. And then real, and as the bigger players saw that the smaller players were using them, they started adopting the fintech. Is that a behavior that you've seen across the region as well? Yeah, what we, I mean, not directly related to that, but what we did see in the data was there is a there is an alignment between newer SMEs and more innovative brands from a financial services provider. So that there is this, this concept of, you know, the traditional banks um, are a little bit more conservative, whereas the fintechs and the big techs are a little bit bolder, a bit, little bit more innovative. What we what we saw very strongly in the data that SMEs in that zero to six year phase, that early startup phase, building, starting to grow phase, um, they banked. They were banked by a very small number of players. When we look at the brands that sit behind that, it wasn't the more established traditional banking brands uh, that you would perceive as being more conservative. And so what we what we see is there's a, a real alignment between innovation in, in fintechs and the, and the real startup market of the SME. Now, that could be a risk appetite thing, or it could be a meeting of minds around innovation. Um, so, that, that's really a trend that came through strongly in the, in the data set. The other thing that's a key trend in the region, uh, and we've seen markets like Hong Kong and Singapore being the early adopters, is really the issuing of new banking licenses. Uh, uh, markets like Malaysia are also venturing the same path. Now, uh, we know also the fact that there's a huge unmet demand regionally, uh, Philippines and India being, uh, Philippines, India, Indonesia being an example of an underbanked and unbanked uh, market, particularly among SMEs. Does, uh, could you share some insights into that from your survey as well? Yeah, there are a few couple of things on that. One is in those markets that you mentioned, the more, let's call them the more emerging markets, um, there was a much more of a propensity to use a fintech as your main financial services provider. So in those markets, we, we think that these new players, new entrants into the market can really take some market share um, because there's a, a willingness to engage with them as the main financial services um, provider. So we, the other thing that we, we see with those new bank licenses that you mentioned, some of those are wholesale bank licenses, particularly here in, in Singapore. And so the concept of a fully digital SME bank is starting to, to emerge. So one of the things that the, the new entrants to the market will need to overcome is in, in the data, we also saw still a desire to have a relationship manager. So the, the importance of the strength of relationship with your RM was seen as important. We think these new entrants that are coming in with digital bank only offerings can overcome that. And the way we think that they can overcome that is through having a really intuitive um, platform. So the onboarding process needs to be seamless. The interaction with the platform needs to feel a little bit human. Um, and if an, a digital only bank can achieve that, then we think they can um, not only lower their costs to deliver because they're taking human out of the loop in terms of um, service delivery, but we think they can catch a market share. 
um, through having that, that really intuitive digital delivery. And we're, we're seeing that SMEs are becoming more digital, digitally savvy. You know, one of the things that the data told us is the pandemic has forced them to get comfortable with digital. Um, not, all, not all small business owners are yet. Um, there's still a bit of a journey. But as they become more digitally savvy, they're willing to receive banking services in a digital way. And that presents a real opportunity for these new entrants and a threat for the incumbents. Yeah, and Andrew, uh, uh, the, the threat part, if I'm a traditional bank, uh, these fintechs are really eating my lunch right now. What do I need to do as a, a bank then to, to counteract these the market share gains from fintechs and big, big tech into the financial services space? Yeah, I, I think it's it's a learning opportunity. And, and I, I do want to be clear, I think the, the bigger threat is from the big techs rather than the fintechs. So what the fintechs bring is agility and innovation. You know, they're, they're dynamic, they're, they're bringing um, products to market that are very um, customer friendly. You know, they're, they're focused on customer experience and that, that is fantastic. What they lack is scale and brand. But if you think of a big tech, you know, you know, a big technology player or a platform player who decides to move into financial services, they bring that innovation and the agility, but they also bring scale and they bring brand recognition. And so I think it's the big techs that will actually be a bigger threat to the incumbents than the fintechs. Um, but having said that, what the banks can, can take from this is a little bit of learning. You know, the, it's going to push them to be more customer focused, focusing on the customer experience, um, learn from what the big techs and the fintechs are doing in this space, learn from that level of innovation. Um, and ultimately, they may end up acquiring some of them. So, you know, a fintech um, who comes up with a really good innovation, if they can't scale that, maybe their best option is to be acquired by a bank. Um, so it's, it's, it's going to be an interesting time in the market, but I think the, the net benefit will be for the consumer. And have you seen, while well, well, talking to, to your clients, that there is an increased appetite to indulge in that behavior, acquisition? Because if you just think back three or four years ago, banks wanted to do it all themselves. Today, there seems to be a shift in thinking. Is that uh, resonating with you across the region? Yeah, that's definitely a trend we're seeing. And you, you'll see, you know, in public public announcements, most of the banks have got some kind of, let's call it an innovation incubator, um, where they might make some seed invest investments or they might, might take control of some of these companies that are doing innovative things and see how they can scale and also how they can plug them into their, their own um, service offering. So we're definitely seeing that as a trend. Um, we're also seeing the banks realise that they need to digitise. They, they have to have a really good intuitive digital offering because even in the SME market, if you're an SME owner, a, a principal running a, a small business, in other parts of your life, people are delivering you services in a really intuitive digital way, whether it's the way you um, get transportation, whether it's the way you order food or shopping um, or interact with your suppliers, every element of your life is being influenced by a digital experience now. But then you go and you, you have your banking relationship. If that's traditional, that will start to become the outlier and you'll start to question, if, if my suppliers can do this, why cannot my bank do it? And so that's, that's going to put pressure on, on the banks to change. And one of the key things that SMEs were facing, and this is not an asia bank thing, it was around the world, was really access to credit. And uh, access to credit from two fronts. One, access to credit in terms of uh, the ability to get credit. And also, secondly, access to credit in a timely fashion. And this is where the fintechs um, obviously had the advantage. Could you share some insights into what your survey has shown in, in both of these aspects? Yeah, that's, it's a really interesting one, actually, because it does highlight that there is a massive expectation gap between the SME and the traditional bank. 
So one of the key findings from the survey is that nearly half of respondents expected to be able to get their cash from the bank within seven days. So their, their expectation was that from the time I go and have a chat to my relationship manager and initiate, I need some funding, whether it's working capital or whatever type of financing I need, their expectation is that that cash will be delivered to them within seven days. That's not where the banks are at today. Now, the digital offerings are able to do that, aren't they, in terms of the fintech providers? Yeah, that, that is the, that's the challenge. So we, we went and had this discussion last week with one of the, uh, the digital-only banks, and we were talking about, you know, is it, is it one, is it three, is it seven? We were talking days. They, they thought we were talking in minutes. And so there is a, there's a real expectation amongst the, the digital players that because they're so good with data, because they um, can use that data to understand the transactions of the customer, and then they can use that to inform a credit decision, they can make that credit decision a lot faster. And so they're in a different place to where the traditional banks are. But Andrew, this is where I, I have a question mark because the, especially with traditional SMEs and their relationship with banks, the banks should have a richness of data and all they would probably need to do is subscribe to some additional services, uh, 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 put out some additional data layers, and they would have a very rich data set. That doesn't be, seem to be the case. Why is that? They do have the data set, but it's, it, this is the disadvantage of being a large incumbent bank with legacy systems that don't talk to each other. And so one of the challenges is, um, how to organise it, how to, how to get all that information that you've got on the customer and bring it all together into a decisioning engine so that you can make those decisions. It's also one of the benefits of someone who's starting from scratch. You know, if you don't have legacy, you can design for that, whereas the traditional bank has not been designed with that in mind because uh, we're in a different world to where we were when all those systems were set up. And it's often harder to change the legacy than it is to start a new. Of course, yes. And so that's one of the things that, that um, banks are grappling with, with. And we've seen that in other markets. We've seen traditional banks come to market with a, a greenfield digital only bank. Um, and that's because it's easier to start a new um, without having to change the legacy if you want to go to a, a digital only offering. And Andrew, uh, we actually interviewed the CEO on, on our show of CIMB Philippines. And that's a classic example of a blank sheet of paper, digital only bank did, that did not use any of the legacy systems of CIMB group. And they basically tailored themselves for that market and grew to 4 million customers in two years. So that's, that's echoing what you just said, literally blank sheet of paper. Yeah. Yeah, we've seen that in other markets. I won't call out any particular brand names, but we've seen that in the UK with a traditional bank start a, a digital only SME bank. Um, we've seen it in Hong Kong in, on the retail side. Um, we are going to see it here in, in Singapore. Um, so if you, if you want to accelerate digital transformation, um, starting from scratch is sometimes not a bad option. Now, one of the things from your survey that I read, which also interested me, was the fact that SMEs were actually interested in utilizing additional services from banks and were, in fact, prepared to pay for it. I would have thought that they would have expected it traditionally for free, but there was a willingness to pay for certain services. Could you kind of shed a light on, on, on some of these areas that they were willing to pay for, these ancillary services? Yeah, that, this is a, another area of opportunity for the banks because, you know, we're, we're in a, a low rate environment and that's obviously causing margin pressure on the bank. So their, their earnings are being, their net interest earnings are being eroded because of that, that low rate environment. And here the data is telling us from these 6,000 odd SMEs that we spoke to, that not only would they be willing to get more from their bank, they would also be willing to pay for that. And so what they would be willing to pay for is things like 
advice on how to run their business, um, financial management advice, um, operational advice, how to run a more sustainable business, um, how to deal with the threats of, of cyber risk from an increased um, digital delivery model. So there's, there's a gap of advice that these SMEs are not getting. And they would be willing to get that from their bank and they would be willing to pay for it. So it may not be that the bank is the, the provider of that, but they provide the ecosystem through which the SME accesses that. So it might be a scenario that the SME logs on to the bank's platform in the morning and they basically stay connected to that bank platform all day long because not only are they doing the banking on that platform, but they're also going and getting um, legal advice or they're getting real estate strategy advice or they're getting um, you know, cyber threat um, advice through, through the bank. And the benefit for the bank is they keep the SME in that ecosystem for a longer period of time and they get to earn a little bit of fee income from doing that. The benefit for the SME is that they're dealing with someone who they've been introduced to by someone they trust. So there's a lot of trust attached to the banking relationship. And so if I go and get cyber advice from someone who my bank has put on their platform, there's an expectation in the SME that that is a trustworthy place to go and get that advice from. So it's helpful for the SME because it's helping them understand who in the market they should be seeking that advice from. So Andrew, that brings an interesting insight because essentially then it tells the traditional banks there's a big opportunity there to build customer stickiness. Yeah, absolutely. And if you think of some of the big platform players who are coming from whether it's shopping or food delivery or transportation and moving into financial services, I mean, what they're doing is basically keeping a, a set of customers in their ecosystem. They're just adding different services. They're adding insurance and banking to that. This is coming from the other way, starting with financial services and, and banking and building an ecosystem that keeps the customer in, that gives them more of what they want. The, 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 the number of services might be different and the type of services might be different, but the concept is the same. Um, but instead of coming from an a separate industry and moving into financial services, you're starting from financial services and moving into adjacent um, adjacent services. And what did the data tell you in terms of SMEs in the region, in terms of willingness to pay? And, and what I mean is, is a Hong Kong SME more willing to pay compared to an SME in Indonesia, Malaysia, or Singapore, for example? Yeah, it's, it, there is a difference. Um, and in fact, it's aligned to the maturity of the market. So in the more emerging markets, there was more willingness to, to get those services from your bank. Um, and it was also in those markets that the SMEs were more willing to pay. So there was a, there was a greater need in, in, the, in the emerging markets and more willingness to pay for those services. So if, if a bank was looking to choose which markets would I launch that into, um, it's likely that they'd have more success if they launch that into an emerging market to start with as a pilot. Andrew, it's been a fascinating uh, insights from the report. So with all this data, how do you then help your clients? So we've, we've had some really interesting discussions off the back of this, and, and our clients have been somewhat surprised by it, particularly when we show them their results. Um, so we look, we can do a, a slice of the data that says, here's you versus here's your, here's your peers or here's the market. Um, so there's obviously they look at where they're falling short, whether that's on the onboarding experience, whether it's the, the time to cash experience or the RM experience or, or other elements. Um, one of the conversations we're having with our clients is how would you get to full digital delivery? Um, so that's, that's partly a cost play, partly a, a customer experience play. Um, but then also, how do, you, how do you start to get your customers along the journey of a fee-for-service type model? So almost subscription banking. So we'll, we'll give you the digital platform for free 
and all of the, the traditional banking product that's on that. If you wanna have a relationship management um, component of that, then it's a, a pay per use kind of view, pay, pay per use kind of model. Um, so, so there's some really interesting discussions around uh, business model and how you can de deliver that to, to your customer. There's interesting discussions around how you compile the data that you've collected on your customers and use that, um, use it to segment them more effectively um, and, and identify when their needs are changing. So rather than wait for the customer to ring you and say, um, I need trade finance, um, you actually proactively reach out to the customer and say, I can see that you've kind of capped out in, in this market. Um, would you like to have a conversation about tapping into another market? Can we help you with trade finance? Can we help with you with foreign exchange? So using that data that you've got on your customer to be proactively engaging with them. Yeah, and technology helps that because you've got AI and machine learning. Basically, all that process can be even automated. Absolutely, and it can also be used We've got a tool that we call the Augmented Relationship Manager, which uses AI and machine learning to help our relationship manager have a really engaging conversation with a customer by delivering them data at the right time. So picking up on what the customer is saying and delivering to the RM information that they can then play back to the customer um, that will help the, help the discussion. And so it's all those, put those tools in the hands of the RM and you'll, you'll deliver a better customer experience. Andrew, any final thoughts you would like to leave us before we end this conversation? I've really enjoyed it. Um, no, it was a fascinating piece of research, uh, I, I must say. I mean, it was, we found a lot more than we thought we were going to. Um, and we are, we are thinking um, we will roll this out as a maybe a every two year kind of exercise. Um, but if there's any banks out there that are Want to dive into the detail? I'm more than happy to have a discussion with you. Shameless plug there, but thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for coming on the show. Okay, thanks. It was great to be here. Now, I'm Brian Fernandez, and I've been speaking to Andrew Gilder, EY's Asia Pacific Banking and Capital Markets Leader, on BizTech's SME Conversation Show. This video will be on our various platforms as well as our website, www.biztech.asia. Please subscribe and like our various platforms. Thanks again for tuning in.